Part four, chapter seven of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four. A voyage to the country of the Winhams. Chapter seven. The author's great love of his native country, his master's observations upon the constitution and administration of England, as described by the author, with parallel cases and comparisons, his master's observations upon human nature. The reader may be disposed to wonder how I could prevail on myself to give so free a representation of my own species, among a race of mortals who are already too apt to conceive the vilest opinion of humankind from that entire congruity between me and their yahoos. But I must freely confess that the many virtues of those excellent quadrupeds, placed in opposite view to human corruptions, had so far opened my eyes and enlarged my understanding that I began to view the actions and passions of man in a very different light, and to think the honour of my own kind not worth managing, which, besides, it was impossible for me to do, before a person of so acute judgment as my master, who daily convinced me of a thousand faults in myself, whereof I had not the least perception before, and which, with us, would never be numbered even among human infirmities. I had likewise learned, from his example, an utter detestation of all falsehood or disguise, and truth appeared so amiable to me, that I determined upon sacrificing everything to it. Let me deal so candidly with the reader, as to confess that there was yet a much stronger motive for the freedom I took in my representation of things. I had not yet been a year in this country, before I contracted such a love and veneration for the inhabitants, that I entered on a firm resolution never to return to humankind, but to pass the rest of my life among these admirable Whinhams, in the contemplation and practice of every virtue where I could have no example or incitement to vice. But it was decreed by fortune, my perpetual enemy, that so great a felicity should not fall to my share. However, it is now some comfort to reflect, that in what I said of my countrymen, I extenuated their faults as much as I durst before so strict an examiner and upon every article gave as favourable a turn as the matter would bear. For indeed, who is there alive that will not be swayed by his bias and partiality to the place of his birth? I have related the substance of several conversations I had with my master during the greatest part of the time I had the honour to be in his service, but have indeed, for brevity's sake, omitted much more than is here set down. When I had answered all his questions, and his curiosity seemed to be fully satisfied, he sent for me one morning early, and commanded me to sit down at some distance, an honour which he had never before conferred upon me. He said, he had been very seriously considering my whole story, as far as it related both to myself and my country, that he looked upon us as a sort of animals, to whose share, by what accident he could not conjecture, some small pittance of reason had fallen, whereof we made no other use than by its assistance, to aggravate our natural corruptions, and to acquire new ones, which nature had not given us. That we disarmed ourselves of the few abilities she had bestowed, had been very successful in multiplying our original wants, and seemed to spend our whole lives in vain endeavours to supply them by our own inventions. That, as to myself, it was manifest I had neither the strength nor agility of a common yahoo, that I walked infirmly on my hinder feet, had found out a contrivance to make my claws of no use or defence, and to remove the hair from my chin, which was intended as a shelter from the sun and the weather. Lastly, that I could neither run with speed, nor climb trees like my brethren, as he called them, the yahoos in his country. 
that our institutions of government and law were plainly owing to our gross defects in reason, and by consequence in virtue, because reason alone is sufficient to govern a rational creature, which was, therefore, a character we had no pretense to challenge, even from the account I had given of my own people, although he manifestly perceived that, in order to favour them, I had concealed many particulars, and often said the thing which was not. He was the more confirmed in this opinion, because, he observed, that as I agreed in every feature of my body with other yahoos, except where it was to my real disadvantage in point of strength, speed, and activity, the shortness of my claws, and some other particulars where nature had no part, so, from the representation I had given him of our lives, our manners, and our actions, he found as near a resemblance in the disposition of our minds. He said, The Yahoos were known to hate one another, more than they did any different species of animal, and the reason usually assigned was, the odiousness of their own shapes, which all could see in the rest, but not in themselves. He had therefore begun to think it not unwise in us to cover our bodies, and by that invention conceal many of our deformities from each other, which would else be hardly supportable. That he now found he had been mistaken, and that the dissensions of those brutes in his country were owing to the same cause with ours, as I had described them. For if, said he, you throw among five yahoos as much food as would be sufficient for fifty, they will, instead of eating peaceably, fall together by the ears, each single one impatient to have all to itself, and therefore a servant was usually employed to stand by while they were feeding abroad, and those kept at home were tied at a distance from each other. That if a cow died of age or accident, before a whinnum could secure it for his own yahoos, those in the neighbourhood would come in herds to seize it, and then would ensue such a battle as I had described, with terrible wounds made by their claws on both sides, although they seldom were able to kill one another, for want of such convenient instruments of death as we had invented. At other times the like battles have been fought between the yahoos of several neighbourhoods, without any visible cause." those of one district watching all opportunities to surprise the next, before they are prepared. But if they find their project has miscarried, they return home, and, for want of enemies, engage in what I call a civil war among themselves. That in some fields of his country there are certain shining stones of several colours, whereof the yahoos are violently fond. And when part of these stones are fixed in the earth, as it sometimes happens. They will dig with their claws for whole days to get them out, then carry them away, and hide them by heaps in their kennels, but still looking round with great caution, for fear their comrades should find out their treasure. My master said, he could never discover the reason of this unnatural appetite, or how these stones could be of any use to a yahoo but now he believed it might proceed from the same principle of avarice which I had ascribed to mankind. That he had once, by way of experiment, privately removed a heap of those stones from the place where one of his yahoos had buried it, whereupon the sordid animal, missing his treasure, by his loud lamenting brought the whole herd to the place, there miserably howled, then fell to biting and tearing the rest, began to pine away, would neither eat nor sleep till work, till he ordered a servant privately to convey the stones into the same hole, and hide them as before, which, when his yahoo had found, he presently recovered his spirits and good humour, but took good care to remove them to a better hiding-place, and has ever since been a very serviceable brute. My master further assured me, when I also observed myself, that in the fields where the shining stones abound, the fiercest and most frequent battles are fought, occasioned by perpetual inroads of the neighbouring yahoos. He said, it was common when two yahoos discovered such a stone in a field, and were contending which of them should be the proprietor, a third would take the advantage, 
and carry it away from both of them. Which my master would needs contend to have some kind of resemblance with our suits at law, wherein I thought it for our credit not to undeceive him, since the decision he mentioned was much more equitable than many decrees among us, because the plaintiff and defendant there lost nothing besides the stone they contended for, whereas our courts of equity would never have dismissed the case, whether either of them had anything left. My master, continuing his discourse, said, there was nothing that rendered the Yahoos more odious than their undistinguishing appetite to devour everything that came in their way, whether herbs, roots, berries, the corrupted flesh of animals, or all mingled together. And it was peculiar in their temper that they were fonder of what they could get by raping or stealth at a great distance than much better food provided for them at home. If their prey held out, they would eat till they were ready to burst. After which, nature had pointed out to them a certain route that gave them a general evacuation. There was also another kind of route, very juicy, but somewhat rare and difficult to be found, which the Yahoo sought for with much eagerness, and would suck it with great delight. It produced in them the same effects that wine has upon us. It would make them sometimes hug and sometimes tear one another. They would howl and grin and chatter, and reel and tumble, and then fall asleep in the mud. I did indeed observe that the Yahoos were the only animals in this country subject to any diseases, which, however, were much fewer than horses have among us, and contracted, not by any ill-treatment they met with, but by the nastiness and greediness of that sordid brute. Neither has their language any more than a general appellation for those maladies, which is borrowed from the name of the beast, and called Hunya Yahoo, or Yahoo's evil, and the cure prescribed is a mixture of their own dung and urine, forcibly put down the Yahoo's throat. This I have since often known to have been taken with success, and do here freely recommend it to my countrymen for the public good, as an admirable specific against all diseases produced by repellation. As to learning, government, arts, manufacturers, and the like, my master confessed he could find little or no resemblance between the yahoos of that country and those in ours, for he only meant to observe what parity there was in our natures. He had heard, indeed, some curious whinnums observe, that in most herds there was a sort of ruling yahoo, as among us there is generally some leaping or principal stag in a park, who was always most deformed in body and mischievous in disposition, than any of the rest, that this leader had usually a favourite as like himself as he could get, whose employment was to lick his master's feet and posteriors, and drive the female yahoos to his kennel, for which he was now and then rewarded with a piece of ass's flesh. This favourite is hated by the whole herd, and therefore, to protect himself, keeps always near the person of his leader. He usually continues in office till a worse can be found, but the very moment he is discarded, his successor, at the head of all the yahoos in that district, young and old, male and female, come in a body, and discharge their excrements upon him from head to foot. But how far this might be applicable to our courts and favourites and ministers of state, my master said I could best determine. I durst to make no return to this malicious insinuation, which debased human understanding below the sagacity of a common hound, who has judgment enough to distinguish and follow the cry of the ablest dog in the pack without being ever mistaken. My master told me there were some qualities remarkable in the Yahoos, which he had not observed me to mention, or at least very slightly, in the accounts I had given of humankind. He said, those animals, like other brutes, had their females in common, but in this they differed, 
that the she-yahoo would omit the males while she was pregnant, and that the he's would quarrel and fight with the females as fiercely as with each other. Both which practices were such degrees of infamous brutality as no other sensitive creature ever arrived at. Another thing he wondered at in the yahoos was their strange disposition to nastiness and dirt, whereas there appears to be a natural love of cleanliness in all other animals. As to the two former accusations, I was glad to let them pass without any reply, because I had not a word to offer upon them in defence of my species, which otherwise I certainly had done from my own inclinations. But I could have easily vindicated humankind from the imputation of singularity upon the last article, if there had been any swine in that country, as unluckily for me there was not, which, although it may be a sweeter quadruped than a yahoo, cannot, I humbly conceive, in justice, pretend to more cleanliness, and so his honour must have owned, if he had seen their filthy way of feeding, and their custom of wallowing and sleeping in the mud. My master likewise mentioned another quality which his servants had discovered in several yahoos, and to him was wholly unaccountable. He said, a fancy would sometimes take a yahoo to retire into a corner, to lie down and howl and groan, and burn away all that came near him, although he were young and fat, wanted neither food nor water, nor did the servant imagine what could possibly ail him and the only remedy they found was to set him hard to work, after which he would infallibly come to himself. To this I was silent out of partiality to my own kind, yet here I could plainly discover the true seeds of spleen, which only seizes on the lazy, the luxurious, and the rich, who, if they were forced to undergo the same regime, I would undertake for the cure. His honour had further observed, that a female yahoo would often stand behind a bank or a bush, to gaze on the young males passing by, and then appear and hide, using many antic gestures and grimaces, at which time it was observed that she had a most offensive smell, and when any of the males advanced, would slowly retire, looking often back, and with a counterfeit show of fear, run off into some convenient place, where she knew the male would follow her. At other times, if a female stranger came among them, three or four of her own sex would get about her, and stare and chatter and grin, and smell her all over, and then turn off with gestures that seemed to express contempt and disdain. Perhaps my master might refine a little in these speculations, which he had drawn from what he had observed himself, or had been told by others. However, I could not reflect without some amazement, and much sorrow, that the rudiments of lewdness, coquetry, censure, and scandal should have placed by instinct in womankind. I expected every moment that my master would accuse the yahoos of those unnatural appetites in both sexes, so common among us. But nature, it seems, has not been so expert a schoolmistress and these politer pleasures are entirely the productions of art and reason on our side of the globe. End of part 4, chapter 7